Live from London, this is BBC News. Funerals are held for Hezbollah fighters killed in two days of exploding device attacks across Lebanon. At least 37 people have been killed and thousands more have been injured. The Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah is due to give a televised address shortly. The Iran-backed group has previously promised just punishment for the attacks. It comes as Israel says it started a new phase in the war and moves troops from Gaza to the north of Israel. Hello and welcome to BBC News. If you're just joining us, we are expecting to hear from the Hezbollah leader, Hassan Nasrallah, in the next few minutes. His first response after two days of attacks in Lebanon. Using sabotage pages and walkie-talkies, a campaign widely believed to have been carried out by Israel's spy agency Mossad. Twelve people were killed and nearly 3,000 injured on Tuesday. Yesterday, 25 people were killed and 600 people were injured in a second wave of blasts. Hezbollah, which is backed by Iran and is prescribed as a terrorist group by the US, UK and Western governments, has promised to retaliate. Fears of an all-out war are mounting. Israel announced yesterday that they've moved to a new phase in this war. The stakes could not be much higher. Well, on today's programme, we'll hear exactly how Hezbollah's leader responds. Our teams in the BBC newsroom, as you can see, are monitoring that. Our specialist correspondents will provide context and analysis. Frank Gardner, our security correspondent, is with me. So is our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale. Daniel De Simone is our correspondent in Jerusalem. Bronwyn Maddox from Chatham House is also with us. She's just back from Israel's northern border. We'll also hear from Malcolm Nance, who's a former US Navy counterterrorism expert. He is in New York. We'll also be getting live reaction throughout the next few hours from Beirut. Well, before all of that, let's start this hour with this report from Hugo Bachega. This is the moment a blast rocks Beirut. Hezbollah had gathered to bury the victims in the explosions of the day before until it was hit by a new wave of attacks, this time targeting walkie-talkies used by the group. Apparently, another operation by Israel. One of the explosions yesterday happened not really far from here in uh, Dahir, which is a Hezbollah stronghold in southern Beirut. There was a lot of chaos and uh, confusion because uh, many believe that no electronic device was safe. Hezbollah members uh, stopped us a number of times, uh, telling us to not use our camera, our phones, and today those concerns continue. It's scary, it's frightening. Where are we going? I've no idea. This is frightening. We can't cope anymore. Of course I was scared. Is there anybody who would not be scared in this situation? You can hide from a bullet, but this is much more difficult. If I wanted to answer my phone now, I'm too scared. This is not a face-to-face -face battle. It's a coward's way to fight. If they want to show us their strength, do it on the battlefield. The attacks in Lebanon began on Tuesday. Pages used by Hezbollah exploded as people were shopping or at home with their families. The group had turned to this old-school technology precisely because of security concerns. It feared Israel was monitoring its fighters' mobile phones to track and kill them. Israel is widely believed to have been behind the attacks. As usual, it hasn't claimed responsibility, but the suspicion is that it managed to add explosives inside the devices. For almost a year, Hezbollah and Israel have been fighting along the border. It's a conflict that so far has been relatively contained, but concerns are rising again that this may escalate into an all-out war. Hugo Bashega, BBC News, Beirut. Well, we hope to talk to Hugo through the course of today's programme from Beirut. I want to show you the live pictures that are coming in to us because uh, they're... 
The statement has just started, so we will monitor that here. This is the first official response we've had from Hezbollah's leader, so we will continue to monitor this. It is likely to go on for some time. But uh, as we see these pictures, let me also bring in our security correspondent, Frank Gardner, and also James Landale, our diplomatic correspondent, who's going to be with me through the next hour or so. Frank, to you, first of all. Hezbollah has promised retaliation, so all eyes on Hassan Nasrallah and what he might say. Yeah, although I think it's going to be more important as to what he orders he gives, because this isn't the first time since the October the 7th raid that he's given a speech, which we all waited breathlessly for, and it was full of fiery rhetoric, and actually not very much happened after it. Let's put it this way. Hezbollah is in disarray. They are hurting. They've been humiliated by this. It's a massive blow to them tactically. Um, it doesn't necessarily change the strategic situation on the northern border. Hezbollah still got their arsenal of 150,000 rockets and missiles that can threaten Israel. The residents on both sides of that border are still kept apart from their homes. So what matters now is how are they going to retaliate and when? And I think Hezbollah will calibrate this quite carefully. So there's a limit to how much you can read into his speech because it'll be full of anger, full of vowed revenge, and we will make them suffer, etc. And certainly there will be a desire from his fighters to do exactly that. You know, many of these people have lost eyes, nose, private parts, you know, really grim stuff from these injuries. So there's a big desire to hit back. But Hezbollah know that if they hit back in a way that targets a lot of Israeli civilians, the retribution in return from Israel, Israel will be catastrophic for Lebanon. James, I'll come to you in a second or two, but uh, as we showed, uh, that statement has just started. So I want to dip in and just uh, see some of the early remarks. Let's put the microphones up. ...and the doctors and the nurses, those whom they've done great hard, there are docs who work around the clock. We have a problem in Lebanon. One, we have actually a huge mass number of injuries in the eyes, and the hospitals, they are not well prepared for this type of injuries. They were under pressure, and that's why they had sometimes there is a delay, but the, the reason for that, not the shortage, but because they, are, they were under pressure. What we witnessed in the previous two days and these days, positive treatment and serious and big and very serious caring, we are very grateful for them. Thanks as well for all those whom they volunteer, they give their bloods in different areas in Lebanon. Even it was said that what happened in Tuesday for giving blood, it was the biggest blood donation in the history of Lebanon. Thanks for those whom they initiated to transport or to take an injured person. Because as you witnessed in the streets, we will we will reach that point. Someone who holds him in his shoulder or his car or his bike. Thanks for all those whom his bike. Thanks for all those whom they were happy to volunteer uh, to donate uh, uh, parts of their pieces for those injured. The greeting and thanks for all the doctors whom they opened their clinics free of charge day and night. Many thanks. Sorry, we the, uh, the political leaders, the ministers, uh, members of parliament, parties, political parties, the elite and the media, and the social organizations and the syndicates and others. From the blessing of these blessed the bloods, and uh, the oppression happened which we witnessed in these days, that we witnessed among the blessing, that what we witnessed in Lebanon recently again, waiting for the 
also among the blessing of this sacrifice. We have to address as well and to thanks for the countries whom they speeded up to send their medical teams and equipment and medical supplies, the Iraqi government, the Islamic Republic of Iran, whom they send an plate to transport as well tens of injured whom they were transported yesterday to the Syrian government whom they opened as well the doors for the hospitals and numbers of the injured were transported to the Syrian uh, hospitals. Also, to many thanks to all the countries whom they contacted the Lebanese government and they initiated the, the, their readiness to help. Also, many thanks for all those whom they condemn these cr cr Israeli crimes from the parties, governments and the elites around the world especially uh, those whom they are part of the resistance in Palestine, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, and others. This is, we started with, with, with thanking, and first and last, thanking for God and Allah for testing and helping and helping and pushing a lot of uh, things. Secondly, on Tuesday and Wednesday, on Tuesday, just I would like to give you just a brief summary as it is well known for you. The Israelis targeted thousands of pages and it was exploded at one time. The Israeli exceeded in this operation all these controls and the rules and the red lines. He didn't care for anything at all. Not ethical, not humanitarian, not legal. The explosion took place, some of them in the hospitals. Some of those whom uh, holding the pages, they were working in the hospitals. And it calls and the street and public road where of the civilian, civilian and women and kids are present were present. If I was targeting the men of Hezbollah and the fighter of Hezbollah, he was targeting the all region whom they were in presence of and he used a tool a civil tools which is used by a wide wide sectors around the world, not women's hospitals, doctors, and commercial companies, and transportation companies. This is the page I'm referring to. Then he repeated that on Wednesday by exploding the talkie walkie. Although he didn't bother about the, the, the place where there was people whom they were holding, there were hospitals, in pharmacy, in the street, at home. It was at the cell that he was holding. It could be it was on the table. As a result of this aggression, tens of martyrs were targeted, among them civilian men and women and children. Thousands were injured. Different type of injuries. The, the numbers will appear. We will have the exact number, but it is a mass number, it's a big number. The enemy is assuming that is, let us talking about the intention, what happened, something else. He is targeting a group, a page, a group, which we will talk about in details. He assumed and he knows that is the numbers exceed 4,000 pieces of pages. And he assumed that is the 4,000, they are distributing of the men of Hezbollah, brothers and sisters, in establishments in different units. When he exploded the pages, instruments, he was intending, we have to talk about the intention, he was intending to kill 4,000 individuals in one minute. 
This is the minimum, the least, to kill 4,000 human beings in, at the moment. That is in addition to what happened on Wednesday for the Turkey work. We were still talking about the pager. That is in addition for those whom they will be killed, whom they are surrounding them. Well, we're going to come away from that. Uh, we will continue to monitor what uh, Hassan Nasrallah is saying. Uh, a key line as he gives his response to those pager blasts, those walkie-talkie blasts, uh, saying that Israel has violated the red lines by detonating thousands of pagers. And uh, just as we were listening to that, uh, let me tell you word. Uh, from the Israeli military saying it's striking Hezbollah targets in Lebanon. We saw that uh, overnight and this morning, so a continuation of that, but also making the point that uh, Israel's military uh, is saying, their chief is saying that uh, they have approved plans for the northern area of Israel. That's come from Israel's military chief. Uh, let's bring in James Landau. He is uh, here with me monitoring the early parts of what we were just listening to. And James, uh, uh, the region is close to the precipice, isn't it? Yeah, and so it's therefore watching what Mr. Nasrallah is saying very, very closely. So far, it's been pretty much what we expected, thanking people, uh, the, the authorities and the, the doctors and people who gave blood and responded to what's happened in recent days. But also, as, as you said, saying that, uh, referring to what he called a great massacre, Israeli crimes, saying that they had breached red lines, saying that what a massacre, Israeli crimes, saying that they had breached red lines, saying that what had happened was not ethical and what was not legal. So far, the, the, the scale of the threat of the response is limited to him saying that this, what happened, requires us to take a stand. And so we wait to see what else he says about what that might mean in practice. James, for now, thanks very much. Let's bring in Bromma Maddox from Chatter House, uh, waiting to speak to us. Uh, she is just uh, back from visiting uh, northern Israel, the border areas. Bromma, welcome here to the programme. Uh, tell us a little more about what you've seen and where you think the region currently is. Israel's been very, very keen to make the point recently um, that the evacuation uh, that its people have felt obliged to, uh, to, to carry out in the northern areas, right, right up close to the Lebanese border, that, that is intolerable and that it wants to get those 60,000 people back uh, who are dispersed across Israel and in the way of things uh, beginning they are uh, kids beginning to settle into schools and so on. It's an increasing question about whether they would ever go back. And the towns up there really very deserted. Uh, the, the mayors and administrators try to find how do they keep them secure against looters and so on. Uh, what are now sort of ghost towns? Um, and the government has added this, it seems to me, to its war aims fairly recently, saying we want to get back. Um, the ability of our residents to live safely there. And the military really forthright in saying, well, it's very hard to do that without us going into Lebanon uh, in, in some sense and pushing Hezbollah back uh, from the border. Um, so that's where it is. It is an escalation of the conflict in the region of exactly the kind that the US and Israel's other allies have been saying, please don't make. Um, it leaves Israel potentially in a very stretched and vulnerable position. Uh, it, it's uh, officials are very keen to talk about the ring of fire uh, encircling Israel uh, with uh, Lebanon and then the, the West Bank uh, and then Gaza uh, at the bottom. Um, but what it's just done is probably to pour fuel on that ring of fire. And what we're waiting to see from Nasrallah and indeed from Tehran, which supports him, is how Hezbollah wants to respond to this. Is it going to respond by escalating the war? Lots of, lots of suggestion that Iran doesn't want a war it can't control either. Um, is Hezbollah going to be specific about what it will do? Uh, but it, I'm sure he will say in, in fiery terms that he intends to do something. Well, exactly on that point, let me tell you, just in the last uh, few moments, uh, he has said uh, this could be called a declaration of war. And I assume he's talking about Israel's actions as opposed to uh, uh, declaring that on Hezbollah's behalf. But wh what do you make of, of the moment we are in, uh, in terms of that sort of language? Um, it comes down to what he chooses to do in response. Words are one thing in the region, 
Uh, there are an awful lot of words, a lot of uh, furious words being hurled about in, in all sides. This is a huge humiliation for Hezbollah. On the other hand, uh, assuming it's Israel, and the US for one is treating it completely as if it's Israel, um, this is partly gets back the ground from the huge humiliation that October 7th represented for the Israeli military and intelligence. Um, I don't think we know where we are until it happens, and Iran does have a lot of influence on Hezbollah. Um, if Iran really wants, as its new president is suggesting, easing of sanctions, which might help the economy and so on, it might choose to rein back Hezbollah. But this is a big humiliation and a provocation, and it may be that Hezbollah's leader feels that in order to maintain the support uh, of his people, he has to hit back. Let me ask you uh, about what a veteran Arab affairs analyst uh, Ehud Yari uh, told the BBC because uh, uh, the view was that uh, his view was that the attacks have created a quote rare opportunity for Israel to act decisively against Hezbollah and its vast stockpiles of missiles. Do you agree with an assessment that for Israel they are looking at this in perhaps a, a different way? And as he was saying, perhaps an opportunity to deal with this threat that's been there for decades. I'm not of that school that thinks that Israel can deal with Hezbollah in any military sense, other than purely tactically, try to drive it back from the border and securing the border and so on. But Hezbollah is an immensely strong force. Some analysts put it as the, the biggest non-state uh, actor and well-armed one in the world. Um, I don't think you know, that, that is uh, going to work. And the question is whether Israel, in reacting so um, tactically all the time to these threats on its borders, is going to deprive itself of the opportunity that uh, many countries are urging on it of having peace with other Arab states, including the great prize, Saudi Arabia, that might help it in its big problem of dealing with Iran in the region. But it's really hard to get into that conversation uh, at the moment in Israel, such as the trauma of October 7th and the sense of threat on all sides. Bronwyn, thanks very much. Uh, let us head to Jerusalem and talk to our correspondent there, Daniel De Simone, waiting to talk to us. And uh, Daniel, I was just saying to viewers that uh, Israel's military have been talking in the last little while, confirming again that there are more strikes uh, that they are carrying out uh, on targets in Lebanon. Uh, what are you hearing? So that's right. So just before Hassan Nasrallah began speaking uh, a short while ago, the Israel Defense Forces uh, put out a statement saying the IDF is currently striking Hezbollah targets in Lebanon. Uh, the Hezbollah terror, it goes on to say the IDF is operated to bring security to northern Israel in order to, uh, to enable the return of residents to their homes, as well as to achieve all of the war goals. And following that, we began to see reports on social media channels here of um, airstrikes taking place in Lebanon. I got a message a few moments ago from a BBC colleague who is in Beirut who said, uh, reported uh, that there was a fight as yet seen above Beirut. So it does seem that there are airstrikes taking place. The IDF has confirmed that. Obviously, as we know, there's been airstrikes taking place for a long time now because Hezbollah has been firing rockets and drones into Israel. Israel has been carrying out airstrikes. Whether this is a larger operation remains to be seen, but we're certainly seeing quite a lot of reports of airstrikes. And as I say, a colleague saying uh, that they'd seen a, 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 um, a jet also above Beirut. Daniel, I'll be back to you uh, shortly, but uh, I want to bring in Malcolm Nance onto the programme, a former US Navy Middle East counterterrorism expert. He's there in New York. And Malcolm, uh, in terms of uh, what we know has happened over the last two days, uh, the walkie talkies being targeted, uh, the pagers, uh, Hassan Nasrallah saying in the last few minutes more than 4,000 pagers were distributed to members of the group. I mean, there is so much focus on how this was actually done. Well, there's a lot of focus on how it was actually done, but what you need to understand is the strategic effect of what was done. Israel apparently infiltrated the supply of what was done. Israel apparently infiltrated the supply chain. They may in fact themselves been the manufacturer of the devices, got the Hezbollah contract, 
provided the devices to Hezbollah and then strategically neutralized three to 4,000 of the top commanders of Hezbollah. If you had a pager, you were a key person within that organization. And let me be honest about this. This may be one of the top five intelligence operations in post-World War II history. It was strategically carried out. It was brilliantly planned. And I think Nasrallah is flailing right now because they're going to have to resort to using human couriers or the cell phone system. And who knows if the cell phones are secure. It's interesting where you ended there because he has just been saying in that briefing, his comments, uh, televised comments, that the group has been dealt an unprecedented blow in all of its history. So uh, exactly what all of the analysts have been saying over the last 48 hours, he too is recognising just the scale of what was done, the infiltration, the damage done. But how fundamentally weakened do you think this group now is? Listen, for Hezbollah to carry out the types of terror operations they've been done, they're carrying out against Israel, which is firing thousands and thousands of rockets, that requires three to four men in a cell or more to get together, to actually have to move the rockets, get to the pre-launch firing positions, and then on command, fire them in such a way that it would overwhelm the Israeli air defense systems. They can't do that safely or securely anymore. And this is what Israel is probably striking right now, is the key communications nodes and commanders who are not on the mobile pagers that are possibly moving into position. This will hinder their operations to doing anything other than small commando raids or firing off rockets in small pockets. It's effectively neutralized their, their organization-wide command and control. And I think they're a little bit frightened today that they'll have to essentially resort to cups and string to communicate as far as the intelligence world is concerned. But Israel knew this. Israel planned this over a very long period of time. This did not just happen in the last year. And this was a way to kill or injure a large number of the, the, the command and control of Hezbollah simultaneously with virtually no civilian casualties. It is a master stroke in uh, kinetic intelligence and military operations. Well, there have been civilian casualties. We've been hearing all of those stories, but uh, I get your point, Malcolm Nance. We will leave it there. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Malcolm, talking about uh, the blow to Hezbollah. Interesting, uh, their chief just saying uh, the big blow of the attacks on the devices will not cause Hezbollah to fall. So acknowledging and recognising the damage, the blow that these attacks have caused, but insisting that uh, they are resilient and they will not fall as a group. That uh, address is still continuing, so let's uh, dip back in. The West Bank, he brought from Gaza to the West Bank, but he didn't didn't uh, remove anyone from the north because he, he has a serious and real threat from the north. He has an issue with the forces. Two days ago, one of the, one of the Israeli channels said because of the numbers of the forces, they will start number, numbers of the marine forces for the feet soldiers in order for them to strengthen their forces in, in, the, in this front. They used the exception, we lost the north, the screaming and the shouting for 11 months of the north. And that is actually why Netanyahu and Gallant, they said that is as a result of are coming to the north to sort out the problem of the north. One of the points actually for pushing, putting this pressure on the, on the enemy, one of the, the important fronts of the long war, in, in addition to the Yemen front and the Red Sea or the Arab Sea or the Indian Ocean, all the weekly cooperation, all the missiles, and the last one was Palestine too, and the Iraq front. This is the Lebanese front. No doubt it is very, very strong and blood pressing front, and it is one of the most important papers for the pressing forces for the Lebanese resistance in Lebanon to deliver their aims. Okay? 
From the first day, the enemy tried to stop the Lebanese support front to distinguish, to distinguish it and stop it, to freeze it. And used for that many attempts actually to put pressure and despite in the ground fleet, he committed to high extent, not completely, to the uh, ground the grounds of rules, not what happened in the 11 months previously, it used to be one percent of what happened in the south before it was a cause for Israel to launch for war, for war for Israel. But what happened, it was a balance of deterioration. They tried to split, to divide between the north and Gaza. They threatened war. You remember, for 11 months, they are giving dates, actually, and those people, some people here in Lebanon, they are helping. In two days, we will have comprehensive war. In two hours, we will have war. In a week, we will have comprehensive war. For 11 months, we are living in this environment, in this... And all the, the, these were targeting to put pressure on the Lebanese government and on the Lebanese and public and on the Lebanese resistance and all parties, and in particular on Hezbollah, to stop this, this front, killing the assassination of the ladies and the individuals and the freedom fighters and destroying thousands of houses just to open at midnight, this is the, 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 the high loud of the airplanes. This attack came with this, this context. All their attempts were failed, did not reach. The resistance remained strong. He reads this way, this is the highest way of criminality. Well, we'll continue to monitor it uh, because I suspect this is going to go on for some while. Uh, we said a little earlier that uh, there were those reports of jets flying over Beirut. Uh, Hugo Bachega, who's there in Beirut, and let me uh, put up the pictures of the skyline over that city, uh, also confirming uh, that uh, he could see and hear those jets flying at low altitude uh, just as uh, Hassan Nasrallah started giving that speech. Let me bring in uh, James Landale and Frank Gardner back into the conversation we've been listening to the last uh, 20 minutes, half an hour. Just as a quick aside, Frank, uh, we don't... 20 minutes, half an hour. Just as a quick aside, Frank, uh, we don't know the location of this uh, news conference or uh, address. There will be paranoia, won't there? within Hezbollah, given everything that's happened over the last two days and events uh, over the last few months? I would be surprised if Mossad didn't know exactly where Hassan Nasrallah is every minute of every day. But to assassinate him would be seen, I think, as, as a step too far. Now, I would slightly temper um, our expectations as to how much of a clue we're going to get from his speech, because just as Bromwell Maddox said, there's a lot of rhetoric here, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of fiery words. But he's not going to go and announce exactly what their operational plans are. Hezbollah is reeling right now. They are in no position to fight a war with anybody. You know, they're completely nonplussed as to how they're going to communicate between their leadership in Dahia, in the south of Beirut, with all their scattered units in southern Lebanon and the Bekaa Valley and, and Syria. So, you know, they are on the back foot right now. Iran is reportedly telling them, wait, revenge, fine, but serve it cold. Do it at the right time. Don't go and lash out now. So we can expect probably a few more artillery exchanges, rocket and drone exchanges across that northern border. But there will be pressure on Hassan Nasrallah to do something bigger than they've done before. But at the same time, his country, Lebanon, will be calling on him for restraint. And James, there have been so many calls for restraint over the last 48 hours. I'm just reading Emmanuel Macron, the latest to pass on messages to Hezbollah to avoid escalation again in the region and again calling on Israel and Hezbollah to avoid an all-out war. And that, I suppose, an echo of the message we've heard from Anthony Blinken as he shuffles around various capitals. Yeah, I mean, look, the hope is that uh, the reality that most sides seem to understand, which is that an all-out war is, is, is not to anybody's benefit. 
but the trouble is, is that the, the diplomats are beginning to rely on that, as if that will ultimately get both sides into the right place on this. Uh, and the thing is, though, is that as this goes on, we escalate from step to step. I mean, Frank is absolutely right. The Iranians will be saying, you know, caution. But remember, the Iranians themselves have yet to respond to the killing of the Hamas leader, Hania, in Tehran. Um, so they themselves are still waiting to, res to, to respond. What's been interesting that what we've just heard from Nasrallah is that it's been a mixture of kind of, you know, facing up to the music. You know, he said this was a major blow. It was unprecedented that this organization has received. But there's also a bit of a pep talk about it, saying, well, well, look, this major blow, he said, will not bring us down. Through this experience, we will grow stronger and prepare for worse. So in other words, what we're seeing this afternoon is not an announcement of what the revenge and response is going to be. It's a sort of OK, we've taken a hit, but we can come through it. In other words, this is a leader of yes, an organisation that's taken a hit. We're still standing. We'll get to the next phase. Now, whether or not, you know, Hezbollah supporters buy that or actually they, they, they reel from this because of the morale blow that they have suffered. But this is a leader trying to bring an organisation together, saying, look, we've taken a hit, but we can move forward. That's a good point to bring in Frank, because, Frank, there'll be people watching around the world uh, as we're broadcasting this, uh, perhaps uh, not as knowledgeable as you about Nasrallah, about no, Hezbollah. Know. So just explain how long he has been leading that group and the group itself in terms of its firepower and uh, what we've seen over the last 12 months in those exchanges with Israel. Sure. So Hezbollah kind of sprang up in the 90, early 1980s as a result of the Islamic Revolution in Iran. And um, also, and as a result of Israel's invasion of Lebanon, and Israel occupied Lebanon for quite some time, they, are, they have become the most powerful non-state force in the Middle East. Uh, Said Hassan Nasrallah is their leader. Um, he's a man with impeccable religious credentials. He is branded as a terrorist leader by Israel and its friends. Um, the 2006 Lebanon-Israel war, which was fought um, close to that border, and I was down in Jerusalem covering that, and I remember Israel thought that it could defeat Hezbollah with air power. The chief of the air staff said, we've got this, we can do this, we've got massive firepower, we can bomb Hezbollah out of the southern border, we've got this. They didn't, they eventually had to go in on the ground with their Merkava tanks, and Hezbollah had already pre-positioned all their mines, as in explosive booby traps, their off-road route mines that would sort of enfilade the side of Israel's Merkava tanks. Israel got a very bloody nose from that. They found that their tanks, which they thought were almost invincible, could not stand up to some of the Hezbollah firepower. Now, that 32-day war ended in 2006 inconclusively. Neither side was the winner. Both sides I mean, Hezbollah took more of a battering. Since then, they have rearmed, retrained, restocked, and replenished themselves. So they have now got a massive arsenal, much of it underground, much of it hidden in civilian areas, that is cocked and aimed at Israeli cities, at military barracks, at high-rise apartment buildings, etc. And Israel knows that should this descend into a full-scale war, However much help it's going to get from America with its offshore fleets, it's going to, its cities are going to take a serious hit. Um, and it's, not, it's going to be very painful. So these are some of the constraining factors. When people say, are we on the brink? Um, Israel's going to think twice. Yes, it's moved its 98th division up from Gaza, so they've now got two divisions in the north, 20,000 plus. That doesn't necessarily mean to say that they are automatically going to invade. James, in terms of Israel's strategy, saying yesterday we're going into a new phase of the war, troop movements. Your analysis of that? Well, this is the big question, as Frank was saying, is do the Israelis really want to do uh, an open offensive against Hezbollah right now? Um, there are some analysts who say that actually, you know, they would prefer to wait that actually, in the long run, yes, they do want to do this, but right now they're still engaged in Gaza. Uh, there are, their military has been stretched. They need to give their, the IDF some kind of time to rest. Um, they want to do it in a place where they can m m maximize international support. I think they probably work out that now is not the time that they would <coughs> get that. Uh, so uh, not all the ducks are in a row for an Israeli operation right now. Um, but the point that whenever you talk to you know, Israelis about Israeli analysts and IDF types, 
they always say, look, Hezbollah is the long term project. Hamas was a short term shock, but the IDF has been planning, training, readying itself for an operation against Hezbollah for many, many years. Many Israeli commanders see this as unfinished business. So the question, the strategic question is, you know, when does that become today's business? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure yet whether the Israeli government knows that, but the huge because it was under huge pressure for, from its international allies not to go there. And James, just as you finish that sentence, uh, the Hezbollah chief saying the group will not stop fighting Israel until the Gaza war ends. And that's been the reality of the last 12 months at least, hasn't it? Which these two uh, hostile activities have been totally intertwined, haven't they? Yeah. Well, you see, this is the, the contradictory analysis. The, the West, the, you know, the United States and the Europeans think that if they can just get a ceasefire in Gaza, then that de de takes all the heat out of these other... Pr pr then that de de takes all the heat out of these other, pr pr at the moment, peripheral conflicts, um, and that th it gives less pretext for uh, a, an open war between Hezbollah and Israel. The problem is that there are some Israeli strategies who think that if they get a ceasefire in Gaza, then that clears the decks and allows Israel to move to what, as, as they now say, is, is the next phase. Frank, a lot of detail we know over the last couple of days about the way this attack was mounted with the pagers, the walkie-talkies. There's been growing disquiet, though, hasn't there, over the last 24 hours, the sense of using communication devices used by many people, not just Hezbollah, but civilians, doctors, nurses, turned into some sort of warfare device. Yeah, it's been condemned by the UN, by the United Nations, and actually Brit Britain's government, which probably considers itself a, a sort of ally of Israel, although it recently did do a partial suspension of arms exports to Israel, which infuriated the Israeli government. But nevertheless, they say they are very concerned by this because turning a civilian, booby trapping a civilian object with explosives is against international law. And of course, Israel has yet to say that they did it. They're not going to own up to this. Um, you know, it took a while before uh, the Mossad operation to hunt down, for example, all the perpetrators of the 1972 Munich Olympic massacre, um, that, that that finally came to light. But I think there is a growing call for an independent investigation into who did this and how and whether international law was broken. Because, you know, children have been hurt in this. Yes, Hezbollah is a prescribed terrorist organization by several governments. Um, but nevertheless, booby trapping ordinary objects like this, where does this end? You know, what if, I mean, can you imagine, you know, you come off air, you check your phone and you hang on, you think, is it going to blow up? That's the feeling right now in Lebanon. You know, Lebanese don't even know whether they dare open their laptops. Should they throw them away? Should they, should they dare even answer a phone call? Are they, are they going to have the sort of injuries that we've seen? So. I, I mean, I would disagree with Hassan Nasrallah, where he said um, Israel was looking to kill four to 5,000 of our fighters. If Israel had wanted to kill them, it would have packed a bit more explosive in there. It was looking to send a message and to maim. Now, some people did die, but less than 1%. Uh, I don't think it was looking to kill. They would have fine-tuned exactly. They knew what they were doing, whoever did this. It's interesting, a couple of points uh, that uh, you go through. Uh, first, it's worth mentioning that Spain's foreign ministry, the latest to condemn the use of those communication devices. Interesting that uh, Nassan Hasrallah just saying in the last little while that the top officials of Hezbollah don't carry the model of pages that exploded. And I suppose that underlines there was disquiet, wasn't there, within Hezbollah about communication devices, phones, as being a potential way that they could be infiltrated? Yeah, so ever since the October the 7th war, uh, or the October 7th raid, rather, the horrific raid into southern Israel, and then the devastating Israeli counter attack into Gaza that has ended up in around 41,000 people being killed, mostly women and children, um, ever since then, um, Hassan Nasrallah and the leadership of Hezbollah warned their fighters, if you want to find an Israeli spy, look no further than your phone. Lock it away, put it in an iron box and don't use it because you will be hacked and tracked. And Israel's military cyber capability is possibly second to none in the world. So you may have heard of the NSO group, for example, which is a civilian company in Israel which develops something called Pegasus. It's the nuclear 
button of cyber malware, which if it infects your phone, the user gets to basically control your phone. These are mostly ex-IDF or Mossad uh, cyber specialists. So they are very good at doing this. And if, if, you know, if they want to track somebody through their mobile phone using GPS or triangulation, they can do it and target that person using a drone. So that's why Hezbollah's leadership said, put away the mobile phones, go back to 20th century technology, let's use ICOMs, walkie-talkies, and let's use cell phones, because they thought they were safe. Turns out that they weren't. Interesting what you were saying right at the start of this, that expect fiery language, expect propaganda, expect all of those things. And uh, just in the last few minutes, uh, Hezbollah's chief saying what happened did not impact our command, control or infrastructure, but uh, just about every analyst uh, would dispute that, uh, given what we've seen over the last couple of days. So exactly as uh, Frank and James were, were saying, in a sense, uh, quite a lot of this is, is messaging to various people in Hezbollah about their resilience. But uh, let's go back to Jerusalem and back to our correspondent, Daniel De Simone, who is there. Daniel, uh, let me ask you, because there have been significant developments there in Israel over the last couple of days with, uh, first of all, Benjamin Netanyahu announcing a new war aim to the north of Israel. Then we had uh, the defence minister say they were entering a new phase of the war. We've also seen troop movements. Give me an idea of the, the public mood, the public support or otherwise for all of that. Well, I think the, the public opinion on this is, is mixed, I think, to be fair. There's obviously um, people want to see the Israeli citizens, 60,000 odd citizens who've been displaced in the north as a result of Hezbollah's actions. But people obviously want to see those people allowed get to get home. They want to see them to return safely home. The, the Israeli government made it a, one of the core, one of the four war aims of this war uh, only earlier this week. And, and the prime minister and defense minister have been speaking about that regularly uh, throughout the week. But that doesn't mean then that uh, the Israeli public at large wants to see uh, an increased uh, full-scale war with Hezbollah because, as Frank and James have been talking about, people hate Hezbollah, but they also do fear them because they know that they are a, a powerful foe. They have a very significant, a very large number of rockets that can strike its targets in Israel should Hezbollah decide to unleash them. So I, I think um, people want to see peace, they want to see a ceasefire, uh, and they want to see Hezbollah degraded, but it doesn't mean they then want to see a full-scale war. I think uh, earlier this week the Defence Minister was saying that they've, he sees it as the, the, the diplomatic way to a ceasefire, it, the route to a ceasefire is narrowing, and that leaves military action uh, as, as the only option. And so there's been a rhetoric throughout the week building up to that. Uh, that was ahead of what we saw in Lebanon with, with the um, walkie-talkie and pager explosions. We already saw a ratcheting up a rhetoric. And then today we've seen uh, the announcement just minutes before Hassan Nasrallah began, start, began speaking that uh, the IDF was targeting uh, Hezbollah targets in Lebanon. There's airstrikes happening as we speak. They've been taking place over the last hour or so. And that's in southern Lebanon. But we're also hearing reports from colleagues in Beirut that Israeli fighter jets have been flying very low over Beirut. Yes. They've been hearing sonic booms. So we're, everything is happening really as we speak. Daniel, let me bring you another couple of lines that uh, we've just heard where Hassan Nasrallah is saying the group has increased readiness of all weapons and all fighters, but then goes on to say quite a significant thing because he has said... Uh, and it's a message to Israeli officials that they will not be able to, uh, and it's a message to Israeli officials that they will not be able to return residents uh, of northern Israel. Now, that very specifically, even overnight, I think Benjamin Netanyahu uh, said on X that that was the aim for some of the actions we've seen over the last few days. Well, well that is that is the stated aim. So until this week, uh, the Israeli, the, the Israeli government, the Israeli security cabinet of the Israeli government had four, um, three core war goals of this war that started on our, with the October 7th attacks by Hamas. They added a fourth this week, and that is the return of those 60,000 odd citizens to their homes. And that was, if you like, a formalization 
of the Northern Front being part of this war. It's, it's not just uh, something that's happening away from Gaza, it's part of the same war. And then we saw uh, the Defence Minister yesterday visiting an Air Force base in Northern Israel, not far from Lebanon, talking about the centre of gravity of this war moving northward, saying there was a new phase in this war. They're not talking about a different war, they're talking about the same conflict. So I think um, what, what we're seeing today is a continuation of that. We just don't know where it's going to go next, because although Israel has spoken about that their goal is to return these citizens home, they haven't said how they're going to do it. Other, we know that airstrikes have been taking place today, and obviously they've been taking place really for a long time now. But that there's a question about whether that is enough to, to achieve this war goal. And, and the Israeli government hasn't said what else it might do. Obviously, no one's anticipating the operation, the, uh, the explosions in uh, Lebanon this week with walkie-talkies and pages. Obviously, Israel hasn't said it was responsible, but it is widely um, thought to be responsible. So we don't know what else might happen. We just don't know at this stage. But the fact that Hassan Nasrallah is saying that is clearly um, he is answering the Israeli government. He's saying you're not going to achieve your war goal. And he's sort of calling their bluff. Daniel, thanks very much. We will talk again in the next hour. But uh, I just want to put uh, more flesh to what Daniel was saying there because uh, we had a news conference only last couple of hours ago from uh, the Israeli government spokesman, David Menser, who was just being asked questions and talking about what we've seen already throughout the course of overnight and today, which was Israel responding to rockets being fired into Israel by Hezbollah. Have a listen. Israel is responding with force to this aggression by Hezbollah. We will use all means necessary to restore security to our northern border and to safely return our citizens to their homes. We will respond with force to this unprovoked aggression from Hezbollah. Well, that was David Menser in the last uh, couple of hours before we started hearing from uh, Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, James, uh, let's take stock. We're maybe almost an hour into uh, what we've been hearing from Hezbollah's leader. Where do you think we are? Because uh, trying to navigate what has been said, some of the fiery rhetoric, some of uh, the historical recap of what has happened over the last 48 hours, where do you think we are? Look, I think we, we end where we, where we started, which is what matters is what does Hezbollah actually do rather than the words we're hearing today. But what's interesting from what, as we're saying today, is there's a mixture of sort of contrition. Yeah, we've taken a hit here, but there's also a degree of, well, it's not as bad as it could be. Uh, he's given us some detail. He said that not all the pages were being held by senior uh, Hezbollah commanders. Some of them had not been distributed. Some of them did not actually explode. So he's trying to sort of, you know, minimise some of the impact. But he's also, um, you know, calling the bluff of the Israelis, saying very explicitly, look, I hope that Israel does enter southern Lebanon because he said, quote, it will give us a, an historic opportunity. In other words, he's trying to sound bullish. Uh, it's, as we said earlier, it's a kind of pep talk for an organisation that has taken a major strategic, tactical and morale blow uh, this is the leader trying to get that organisation back on its two feet, saying, look, we're still here, we can still uh, make an impact. Um, there's an element of kind of bring it on to the Israelis. But all of this, you know, will just add to the tensions and add to the fears that this could escalate out of control uh, in a way that either side uh, don't anticipate. Give me an idea of diplomatically what is happening, especially out of Washington, because with Anthony Blinken, we see him shuttling through various capitals, quite often saying the same thing about uh, the need to de-escalate, said yesterday that they had no prior knowledge of what was going to happen there in Lebanon with these e explosions. They were gathering the facts. But behind the scenes, give me an idea, is there disquiet at some of the new tactics the Israelis are using, the new phases they're introducing? Um, when uh, the, the last time Anthony Blinken did said anything publicly was yesterday when he was standing next to the Egyptian foreign minister after his meeting there, before he came to Paris this morning. And he made it absolutely clear that, um, you know, he saw, as I said earlier, he said that uh, a ceasefire in Gaza is what is the key to all of this. And he complained about events things escalating, getting in the way of getting a deal, which was clearly a reference to the events of recent days. Um, so clearly there is a degree of frustration. I think there's a, if you talk to American officials, there's a degree of frustration that we are seeing at the moment limits 
on US influence over Israeli policy. Uh, but at the same time, there will continue to be a lot of American messaging to the Israelis say, look, you've got to hold back, you've got to you know, resist um, further escalation. But at the same time, the Americans will be talking to allies in the Gulf, saying, you've got to talk, any connections you've got with uh, Hezbollah, let's talk to the Iranians, just try and pour some oil on these troubled waters, just to keep this man manageable at the moment. I yeah. suppose the worry is whether Anthony Blinken is simply being ignored now. Yeah, well, that, 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 is, that is the question. Um, uh, we, you know, are we seeing the limits of American influence um, in the Middle East at the moment? I mean, Thanks. Just go on. The analogy I would give here is imagine, sorry, forgive me for just sort of bring it, dumbing it down a little, but imagine if I come up to you and I punch you in the face, you're going to be pretty cross with me. And there's Anthony Blinken sitting over here saying, oh, no, 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 hang on, Matthew, don't retaliate, calm it down, don't do anything. You're going to want to retaliate. And that's the feeling right now amongst the uh, Hezbollah fighters, many of whom have got life-changing injuries. And just in the last few seconds, uh, the latest line coming from uh, that uh, briefing saying the attacks on Tuesday and Wednesday will meet a just punishment. But I, I suppose it comes back to something you said earlier on, which was it doesn't necessarily mean that that action, that response will come now. There is that. I mean, one of the things that I think we in the international community and in the media and particularly in the West, we tend to, we underestimate the resilience of outfits like Hezbollah and Hamas and the Taliban, for example, in Afghanistan. We tend to think superior firepower is going to dominate. It doesn't always. Frank, thank you for being with me. James, thank you for being with me for the last hour. Frank, I know you're going to stay. I just want to uh, end this hour by taking you back and showing those uh, live pictures because Hassan Nasrallah continues uh, to make that statement. We are monitoring all the times our various teams. We will be back to that uh, here in the next few moments. Uh, so don't go away. Much more reaction to what we're hearing with uh, those attacks on Lebanon and this the response from Hezbollah's leader.